Okay, it's Firearms Friday at the Wyoming State Museum here in Cheyenne. I'm Evan Green. I'm the firearms historian for the museum, and I've been working in the collection for about the last five years. Uh, we have about almost 400 firearms in the collection, as well as firearms artifacts, holsters, we got swords and knives. So uh, I had some people ask, well, you know, what do you actually do other than just make videos? So to answer the two people who were interested in that, I'm going to talk about it a little bit. <clears throat> and those of you who are just here for the guns, be patient because we'll eventually get to them. So anyway, basically I do four things starting each time with a firearm. We have a uh, powerful database, it's called Past Perfect, and a lot of information about all the firearms are in that database. Given that we have over 80, 85,000 artifacts, uh, and all of those were entered in that database, there's occasionally incorrect or misleading information in there. I find it often with firearms that the person who did that initial cataloging may not have been familiar with firearms. So either the identification is questionable or sometimes just it's, it's just a matter of correcting the terminology. They don't have the right words for the features of the gun. So that's one, is fact checking. <clears throat> Two, and we'll hear more about that in a minute, is identification. What is the firearm? <clears throat> now, anything made by your traditional makers in the United States, Remington, Winchester, Marlin, Colt, um, they have serial numbers that you can use to establish uh, the year that it was manufactured. They often have the maker's name, the address, and the patent dates, and the model of the gun stamped somewhere on that firearm. So that's pretty simple. It gets difficult when we have something like this where there are uh, only a few markings, none of which really identify what this is. So anyway, identification. The other is to insert into that database the history of a particular firearm. Say, for example, trapdoor infantry rifles. I have a cut and paste thing that will assist future people working in that database with here's the history of the Springfield trapdoor rifle. And the other thing, this maybe the fourth thing, is uh, I try to authenticate or dismiss the stories associated with those guns. And that's, that's perhaps the most difficult part of the job, and I can spend hours and hours, uh, days and days, trying to do that. It's difficult to prove it's correct. It's difficult to disprove those stories. And we'll talk about that in a little bit uh, in the next video, because I've got some firearms where the stories really don't match what we know about the gun. So, okay, <clears throat> this is one. I looked at this firearm first in 2019, and I've learned a lot in the last four or five years. But at the time I went, what in the world is this? I have no idea, there's no markings that I can see. There's some numbers and some letters and a squiggle here on the lock plate. I have no idea what this is. <clears throat> so when I went through again and pulled this out, knowing a little bit more, I was able to identify that proof mark as coming from Austria. So it turns out that this is an Austrian-made Lorenz musket. Now, it has been modified because it would have originally had a full-length forearm uh, that reached to the end of the barrel. But once I knew that it was Austrian, and because it's percussion, we know that it falls in a fairly narrow time range. The percussion ignition system didn't replace the flintlock until late 1820s, 1830s. So that gives a time reference. Well, again, it turns out this is a uh, Austrian Lorenz per per percussion uh, musket. And uh, how did it get to the United States? Well, when the Civil War started, the United States, the Union, 
and the Confederacy were short of firearms. So the Union imported 220,000 of these Austrian Lorenz muskets, and the Confederates imported 100,000 of those muskets. And we know this is a Confederate musket because it has a fixed sight. The Union version had an adjustable rear sight. And uh, so I'm just probably 95% confident that in its original form, this rifled musket probably saw action on the Confederate side in the American Civil War. So I think that's pretty cool. So that's one I tracked down. I'm pretty proud of figuring that one out. And we'll have, a, we'll insert some pictures, uh, a close up of that proof mark, which I initially thought might be, might have been Russian, but upon examination, it is the Black Eagle of Austria, and we'll have a picture of that symbol as well. So I'm going to set this one aside for the moment and grab another one. Okay, this is another percussion musket, and I have no idea what it is. Um, there's no markings. It's so rusted and corroded that I can't find any of the markings. In its general configuration, it resembles the contract muskets that were made by several different manufacturers over the course of the Civil War, primarily made for the Union. So uh, one of the things that helps me in my research is Google Images. You can put in percussion musket, Civil War, and just scroll through those images and looking for something that matches. And we'll talk a little bit more when we have this old rusty lock plate under the, under the magnifying glass. But this is kind of unique in the shape of the hammer, this ridge on the outside of the hammer, and this little unit right here, which is called the snail. It's the mount that holds the nipple that receives the percussion cap. And the shape of the nipple, the shape of the hammer, the general configuration of the hammer will vary from gun to gun by different manufacturers. But I couldn't find it. Couldn't find anything that matches this one in particular. The other thing that is kind of unique about this one is this front barrel band, which incorporates the front sight. And once again, that's a fairly unique thing. We have two other uh, Civil War era muskets in the collection that have something similar with this uh, place here that accepts the uh, ramrod. Uh, one of them has three barrel, three bands, not two. The other one doesn't have the front sight, but has the front sight out here on the end of the barrel. So if anybody's got any idea what this is, put it in the comments because I'm stumped. I had to give up on this one. Again, I suspect it is a Civil War era contract musket for the Union. Uh, could have been a Confederate firearm. Couldn't find anything there either. So let's move on a little bit. This is a, this is a Smith & Wesson. Uh, it's called a Baby Russian. It's actually the first model single action revolver made by uh, Smith & Wesson. It's chambered in the 38 Smith & Wesson caliber. So this one for me was easy because I've, I've looked at these guns this type of gun, they were a popular side match gun in cowboy action shooting. So I recognized it right away, even though you can't read the information on the barrel or anything else that's stamped on the gun. So that, that, was, that was an easy one, easy one for me anyway. So okay, what's this? Let's take a look at this one. Uh, again, I talked earlier about information in, in, entered into our database by people who may not be familiar with firearms. This is clearly a lock plate and hammer from a percussion rifle, I believe. I'm pretty sure. Uh, but it was entered in initially as the lock plate and hammer for a Schneider Enfield. Well, oops, Schneider Enfield is a cartridge gun. This is clearly a percussion gun. So once again, uh, I could tell from the shape of this lock plate that it's what's called a back action lock. That means that the 
the mainspring and uh, sear operating the hammer is behind the hammer, not in front. If it was in front, it's generally called a box lock. And these back action locks were not very popular in the United States, but they were in Europe. So off to Google again. Uh, 1840 percussion European musket with a back action lock images, and it's popped right up. This is from an 1840 French military musket. It was found 15 inches down in the ground by a guy with a metal detector on the Tongue River uh, at Dayton, Wyoming, which is kind of north central Wyoming. So uh, again, numbers of these French military muskets were imported by the Union for the Civil War. And again, the identifying characteristics here, one, the back action lock, and we'll put up a picture of a lock plate that's clearly visible from an 1840 French military musket. And you'll see a couple things. One is this semicircle cut right here, the location of this pinhole, and again, the very sharp angle between the body of the hammer and the hammer spur. Clearly, 1840 French military musket. Okay, we got one more thing to look at here. Okay, what, what in the world is this? It ended up in my inbox because it was initially identified as a firearms fragment. And I thought, mm, I don't know about that because I, I see no evidence of its function. There's no wear on it. Uh, I thought, is, was it an inlay? I don't think so because it's quite, quite thick and really not a very good quality. It's a simple cast unit. <clears throat> so for the first time, I used Google Lens. And <laughs> they say, you know, even a blind hog gets an acorn once in a while. And one other artifact like this popped up. It is a latch from the interior of an 1877 trunk. It has that patent date on it, October 23rd, 1877. So it, came, it was a latch that held a part of the internal components of the trunk closed. And what's kind of cool is that this is among many other artifacts that came in from Russell Thorpe back in the seven, or 40s. I think he donated most of the stuff in the 40s. Russell Thorpe was a descendant of the last owner of the Cheyenne to Black Hills Stage and Express Company. So this came off a trunk. Is it possible that it fell off a trunk en route to either Black Hills to Cheyenne or Cheyenne to Black Hills? Uh, don't know, can't confirm that, but it's interesting speculation and a pretty cool artifact. So if you've got any questions, particularly if you can inter help me identify that other musket, uh, put them in the comments. Uh, if you want to talk about guns or Wyoming history, you can... Uh, call the museum at their main number and they will take a message and I'll get back to you. So thanks for watching.